Uh, your current project, I happen to know, is a history of egalitarianism. Could you say a little bit about that and how uh, you how that came to be your current project? Right. So um, I've been in, involved for many years now in a dispute with the major school of post Rawlsian egalitarianism, which in an article I wrote back in the 1990s, I dubbed luck egalitarianism, and that term st stuck. So luck egalitarians think that the principle in justice is that people get stuff out of sheer luck, that inequalities are generated due to factors that have nothing to do with what they deserve or what they're responsible for. And when I read this, uh, there's a whole school of philosophers who believe that, and I thought that was basically wrong, and my inner Rawls came out. Rawls, of course, was my dissertation advisor. And even though earlier I wasn't really all that concerned about issues of distributive justice, this really fired me up. <laughs> and I thought, no, that's not what egalitarianism is about. It's not about objecting to inequalities that arise that are undeserved. Fundamentally, it's about constructing a society of free and equal people, okay, where we relate to one another as free and equal. So I call this relational egalitarianism or democratic, democratic egalitarianism. And it was definitely inspired by the account of distributive justice that Rawls had in mind. He thought that people would free and equal people in a democratic society would sign on to his principles of distributive justice because they expressed their relations to one another as free and equal. And then I was thinking, well, I think that this is really deep in the history of egalitarianism. And I wanted to vindicate this relational view by going back to the origins of egalitarian thinking the levelers, so, according to... The levelers, yeah. Well, you can even go back a little bit further to the Anabaptists. <laughs> they were pretty wild. The Anabaptists, they had, they had a lot of egalitarianism, but they weren't so keen on the freedom part. <laughs> right. So what I'm interested in is that part of egalitarianism that wants to combine the ideals of freedom and equality. And yeah, so I'm starting it with the levelers and I'm going to move forward, certainly through the 19th century, probably through the Second World War, maybe even up to the present, but that's a little ambitious now. Right now, I've just been, I've just chunked off one piece of the story. It's a pretty big piece, um, which is about abolitionism. Who were the abolitionists? What were they about? Uh, how did they inspire all kinds of other egalitarian movements, which they did? Feminism in the United States grew out of abolitionism, for instance, democratic movements, the labor movement. Um, and I'm in particular interested in questions of moral epistemology. So if you look back 300 years ago, very few people thought that slavery was morally wrong. I mean, you could find isolated people who condemned it, but in society as a whole, it was just taken for granted. Well, sure, we have slaves. <laughs> um, and then you see these abolitionists, you know, in the early 18th century, not just from the Enlightenment, but also religious strands, the Quakers, notably, who, of course, were, they got their start in the English Civil War back in the mid 17th century. And then went on but, to make very good chocolate. They did indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and oats. <laughs> no, they were actually, they were very prosperous and successful. <laughs> they were good capitalists, but they wanted free labor. Um, so I, I'm going back and I'm trying to think, how does moral consciousness change? And I think that this is incredibly important because starting with the Quakers and other, uh, other abolitionist groups, um, evangelicals, enlightenment figures, they start a whole new way of thinking about morality and interpersonal relationships within which slavery appears to be the most horrible injustice, a paradigm of injustice, whereas before people thought, well, there's no problem with it. Of course, there are slaves. So this I find incredibly interesting from the standpoint of moral knowledge. What it shows is our moral thinking can change in fundamental and dramatic ways. And we think, looking back, that this is a mark of great progress, and I agree. 
but without begging the question in favor of our current moral intuitions, I'd like to know, do we have any, can we look at the process by which our moral beliefs changed and find anything that would be indicative that of progress without just begging the question in favor of our current beliefs? Well, I mean, the, the current movement about gay marriage, you'd think would be a good, fairly good Absolutely. case. Absolutely. I mean, that's the most amazing change in the, uh, my recent lifetime. I mean, when I first started as a graduate student, we, we had, uh, you know, homosexuality as a contemporary moral problem. It wasn't even gay marriage. It was just right. being gay. And, and right. now, you know, you have Republica, Michigan Republicans have just come out and signed a document saying, OK, our bad, you know, we realize we screwed up. Yes, exactly. And see, this is a great moment even today of advancement in egalitarian moral thinking. So I'm very interested in exploring how that came about. So maybe we should talk a little bit about, about how that came about, because I think there's connections. What got uh, this tremendously rapid change in moral orientation to uh, LGBT people? We had a whole social movement, <laughs> right? Gays decided to organize and strategize about how to change people's beliefs. And a critical part of that was the movement to come out of the closet. I think this was tremendously important because what they were doing was building on the fact that people already had good, strong, loving, cooperative relations with their family members, with their co-workers, their neighbors and friends and so forth. So they already knew and trusted these people coming out then sort of reveals, hey, you know, <laughs> gay people are just as, you know. Well, who was the Supreme Court Justice who, who ruled on that case and then, you know, said, I don't know any gay people to his, his most loyal and trusted clerk. And it turned out that person was gay and had never told him. And it was like, why didn't you tell me before we made this decision? <laughs> Right, right. That was Justice Powell. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So what I see is critical to this is you had a social movement. And that also was critical to abolitionism. Certainly in England, uh, the British abolitionists essentially invented the social movement. The whole collection, the whole repertoire of activities that we now take for granted Whenever you, we want to change some public policy, you know, you create local chapters, you take down everybody's name and you organize committees and you submit petitions and you publicize grievances and you collect documentary evidence of what the problems are and have book tours and publicity campaigns and icons and slogans. Twitter, Twitter right. <laughs> and, you know, you, you'll have... Uh, various vivid images and so forth that encapsulate the grievance and then you walk, you go around you try to persuade people get them on board have fundraisers you, you write a report card on your legislator and report back to the members on how they voted on issues all the whole repertoire litigation strategies putting that whole package together that was the genius of the British abolitionists they, they invented the social movement and basically, we today are still reaping the benefits of that. Whenever we want moral change, we look back at that handbook, so to speak. Well, unfortunately, it fell into it. the hands of the NRA as well. So, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> is that, so, yeah, one of my stories is, is that just, you know, social movements in and of themselves are not uniformly progressive, in a, in, not just in content, but also epistemologically. And so one of my questions is, how can we tell? Is there anything that distinguishes the ones that are liable to lead to moral learning from the ones that don't? And one way to think about it is, is that social movement speaking truth to power? Okay, because I see the social movement fundamentally as an instrument for <clears throat> dislodging or altering or correcting or counteracting the moral biases of the powerful. Now, 
do you think it's always grassroots or do you think that um, I mean because a lot of the figures that we're, that we remember that are, you know get remembered tend to be members of the elite who had a crisis of conscience or something and you know suddenly came around and they were already in a position to make more waves so you know uh, John Stuart Mill of course is a, is a figure but he he was um, he was very uh, much a member of the establishment and was in a position to to make uh, you know, to have an influence. Um, and it's not, and, and would you, maybe the levelers are more of an anomaly than, um, than the main kind of model. Yeah, so actually that's a really great question. And I think one has to view, Mill was certainly a pioneer in certain respects, especially with regard to his feminism. You know, he stood up in, as a member of parliament and argued for uh, giving the franchise to women. And he was, he <laughs> was laughed out of Parliament practically <laughs> for even suggesting it. But so he was ahead of his time in certain ways. But it's also the case that he was riding a wave of popular democratization. So it wasn't all top down. And in fact, the way I read most egalitarian theorists in the in the canon of philosophy is you dig down below and you see there's popular ideas bubbling up. And what the canonical authors are doing uh, is making them rigorous and sort of analytically putting the pieces together in a sharper and more perspicuous way than what you find, say, in popular pamphlets. But there had to be people who, who convinced them. There had to be their, their voices on the road to Damascus. Well, right. And so for Mill, for instance, Harriet Taylor was clearly a critical actor in converting Mill to feminism. Now, um, this work is predominantly intellectual history. Is this something, uh, are you finding this new? I mean, is this something that is a novel experience for you or is this uh, a sort of no, uh, an outgrowth of the way you've always done things? So more and more, uh, the way I do philosophy is to read a whole bunch of stuff that isn't philosophy and then philosophize about it. <laughs> and I found this to be an incredibly fruitful way to work. Uh, there's a lot of latent philosophical ideas out there and all kinds of social scientific works uh, in popular uh, culture and thinking in uh, the works of popular movements and so forth. They're incredibly rich with ideas uh, and so more and more what I like to do is to take my problems from the world or from other areas of inquiry and think philosophically about them. And the appeal of this, though, goes way back in my own personal history, because the way I learned how to do this uh, was when I was an undergraduate at Swarthmore College, I took a legendary history and philosophy of science course from Hugh Lacey, a wonderful philosopher of science. And what we did in that course was read a lot of the original scientific texts. We're poring over Galileo and Copernicus and Newton and trying to make sense of it. Wow. But we're also seeing that there are all kinds of philosophical problems and conundrums that these texts, you know, that these scientific works are generating internally. And the, the drive to philosophy comes from inside practice and from inside inquiry. And then, you know, sometimes then you have to maybe just engage in philosophical thinking about these other problems. Now, of course, philosophy also generates its own internal problems, but I prefer to work with the problems that are generated in other domains. Real problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, the... Um Oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, well, I, I, the other person I just interviewed was uh, was Alan Buchanan. And I don't know if uh, you read much of his stuff, but that seems to be uh, he approaches things in the same way. I mean, both of you are very much interdisciplinary thinkers. And I noticed, actually, um, one thing you mentioned, and I've, I, uh, I've looked into it, is the you've started a PPE program at Ann Arbor. Uh, is the, uh, and this is the same kind of theme, that you want to get this uh, cross-disciplinary approach. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's I think it's important both for philosophers to be more empirically informed and also for the social sciences to be more normatively informed. I think uh, in a way the division between philosophy and the social sciences is partly intellectually a product of the fact value distinction <laughs> as if we can come up with values without referring to any facts at all. Right. <laughs> I don't think that's true really. I hope not. Uh, but it's also the case that uh, that the social scientists have felt that their legitimacy rests on getting rid of any connection to values. I just think that's crazy. What are we investigating society and human beings for because we have normative concerns. What's going to enable people to flourish? What kinds of social relations uh, lead to good results or horrible results? I think, <laughs> you know, yeah, when I read, um, when I read stuff that is not philosophical, but is, you know, more social scientific or even uh, medical stuff, what I think is what uh, the impression I get is that they don't think they have assumptions. They don't think that they have the that there are assumptions under what they're doing. They think that it's all a tower of facts, you know, without any <laughs> uh, any assumptions in the, you know, in the um, uh, in the basement. And, and I think that is a value uh, of applying uh, philosophical methods to this is to point out no, you're assuming this, and you know because you're assuming this, you need to defend this. And I think that's something that may be philosopher that, that is distinctive about the philosophical approach and that, that pisses the other people off because we're always asking questions that they thought they've moved past. Yes, I, to so, some of them that pisses them off, but other, others are actually more open to the idea. I mean, the people who are engaging in the social sciences with an underlying normative impulse, like they want justice, are actually rather interested in seeing that impulse, the the legitimacy of it, vindicated in in their own uh, inquiries. So I think we have sort of a split because a lot of people are interested in the social sciences precisely because right they want to make the world a better place. Yeah, it's odd that uh, philosophy has I think I, I I get this impression that philosophy has this sort of love. For, hate relationship with uh, the other disciplines, particularly sci science. I mean, uh, it's a criticism from continental philosophers, which means we can dismiss it, but that, um, <laughs> you know, that Anglo-American philosophy, analytic philosophy is science worshipping. Uh, and, and there's a little bit of that, that I think uh, that we're a little em envious of their tools, of the scientist tools, you know, and, and you can kind of see this when logic when philosophers really got into logic every you know there was a period there where everything had to be demonstrated in you know symbolic logic form otherwise it wasn't really an argument um but at the same time but then we also have uh, this view of how you know uh we're more fundamental than science so it's this uh, it's we're kind of like dostoevsky's underground man we we think that they're great but at the same time we think they're not so great <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's something to that. The other thing too is that it's worth looking at uh, at the continent for certain models. So I was just I just finished Thomas Piketty's uh, work, right. Capital in the 21st Century, and here's a here's an economist who, in fact, criticizes economics for having excessive mathematization. He thinks you don't really need this to get the core uh, economic realities on the page. This massive tome has two distinguishing features. One is a work in economics. The whole theory is encapsulated in three equations, two of which are accounting identities. <laughs> so we're talking about very simple mathematics, but he gets the core of the argument out with you know basic algebraic equations that any educated person could easily grasp. But secondly, he's also a humanist. What he's interested in is is not just you know technical measures of inequality like the Gini coefficient. What he wants to know is when the distribution of income looks like this and the distribution of wealth, what kind of a society do we end up having? So he digs back into 19th century novels by Balzac and Austin and shows you, look, if you have a society where the really immense wealth 
is acquired by inheritance. You create a society in which the actual work you do counts for almost nothing because you can't, you can't make a fortune just by working. The only way to really be big and powerful is to marry into wealth or be lucky enough to have really wealthy parents. <laughs> and, you know, you get a very decadent society that looks like this. And so his worry is we're heading back, <laughs> you know, to the bell epic. Well, where, where's our Jane this Austen? Is what it was well, like. At least we want a Jane Austen if we're going to go back. <laughs> right. Well, right. do you think, uh, do you think then that egalitarianism might have a moment? I think it's ready, yes. So what we're getting now is a return to the extreme levels of inequality that were seen in the 19th century. Uh, and, you know, I, I see the Occupy movement, even though it didn't last as a kind of initial kind of protest movement as people become aware of, of where we're headed and what its implications are. And more fundamentally, people are more and more angry at the way the rich have captured the political process. In this respect, just to give you an example, it's not a concern that's solely on the left. So if you look at, say, Eric Cantor just got unseated, so, you know. By an uh, economics uh, professor. <laughs> yes, by an economics professor who is known to be a Tea Party candidate. But if you look deeper, it turns out the press said it was all about immigration and people are upset about immigration. But if you look deeper, actually, <clears throat> a big part of his campaign was that Cantor was the creature of crony capitalism, that he's handing out from Washington all kinds of favors to big business. And it's Wall Street that is screwing over Main Street. And actually, if you see the, uh, the people on, uh, in the Republican Party who are kind of mobilizing against him, you, you kind of... Well, yes, <laughs> he is not popular amongst the, you know, the, the big business part of the Republican Party. Yeah. Um, so, well, what about the Tea Party? I mean, the Tea Party seems to be a social movement. Uh, would you say that, yeah. would you say that, they, that it's not really a cohesive thing, that there's parts of it that may be grassroots, but then there's also these forces that are trying to co-opt it? Or what is it? Well, <clears throat> Yeah, there are parts of the Tea Party that I think resonate and can connect up with uh, parts of the egalitarian agenda. Front and foremost is resentment at crony capitalism. That's why they hated the bailouts of the big Wall Street banks. They thought they should have just gone under. Right. You know, they made a bunch of bad bets. Why should Washington bail them out? Now, as an economic proposition, I think it's a little crazy because if you let them all go, then we're in a Great Depression. It's very hard to get out of something that big. Uh, so I, I see the Tea Party, though, also as very disturbed by emerging plutocracy and corruption. The idea that the super rich are just buying elections, they don't like that. This is a real opportunity, I think, uh, uh, for a wide spectrum of the American people to get on board. The downside of the Tea Party is that um, if you look at their uh, organization of information, who they listen to and how they process information, I think they're in a major epistemic bubble. <laughs> and so they're not really connecting up with reality in useful ways. There's too much paranoia, too much bigotry, too much listening to people who are scamming them uh, and not enough kind of listening to a wider diversity of opinion. But, uh, what, what is it? Um, Stephen Colbert said reality has a well-known liberal bias. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but how do you, um, I mean, how does that bubble get burst? I mean, we're now uh, at a point where um, we do tend to, uh, more and more, it's driving towards uh, a case where you're just exposed to the reality that some algorithm has decided is the reality you want. Oh, yeah, I agree. Look, I, I, I think it's the way Google is filtering our searches and Taylor making them to them, I think it's really wrong. I think they sh what they should do is 
there's reasons why they have some tailor, you know, tailoring of search results, especially if you're shopping or something. But if you're looking for information or political information, I think the Google algorithm should be tweaked so that at random they just toss out some stuff far outside the sources you're used to looking at. Hey, maybe this is what economists <laughs> should click. be doing. This, maybe this will yeah. be the, the goal for hackers. Yeah. To mess with our reality. Yeah. <laughs> your, your most recent book was also in this theme of, uh, of sort of in, uh, engaging with social science, with the imperative in, of integration. Could you say a little bit about that? Right. So um, <clears throat> for a long time, I've been interested in issues of racial inequality uh, and it started off at more of the curricular concern at the University of Michigan where I teach uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, racial animus because students were coming to campus and kind of uh, from different racial backgrounds and kind of meeting each other for the first time <laughs> those initial encounters aren't all that great so uh, Years ago, decades ago, really, a group of faculty at the University of Michigan decided to address this with a curricular response. And I, I taught one of the courses uh, that was dealing with racial inequality and other kinds of inequality, a law and philosophy course that I've taught for many years. But a after teaching, it kind of inspired me to think more systematically from a research perspective about these problems. And I started reading a lot of social scientific works about the origins of racial inequality and how it's perpetuated today, even in the, you know, even after the abolition of slavery and Jim Crow and establishing anti-discrimination law, we still see a lot of racial inequality. And what I discovered was a lot of this is generated by racial segregation, especially at the residential level. Uh, it's quite severe. I lived in Detroit for a few years in a neighborhood that was about, I don't know, 75% black. Uh, and then, you know, I was commuting from Detroit to Ann Arbor, which is overwhelmingly white. You just see this tremendous difference. People are living in different worlds. Hey, I'm in Flint. They're not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> now, a lot of, I think, whites predominantly are completely out of touch with the reality of segregation and what it means uh, uh, and how that builds into concentrated poverty and very deprived neighborhoods that have very few resources, uh, difficulty finding jobs, high unemployment and so forth. So I started putting the pieces together, you know, using a lot of the work of social scientists and also thinking about these problems from the perspective of democratic theory. Uh, largely informed by people like John Stuart Mill and John Dewey about how democracy isn't, isn't just the dictatorship of the majority. Uh, that's a wrong con conception of democracy. And if you want to see it in action, you look at what the Muslim Brotherhood was doing in Egypt, right? They said, okay, we're the majority now. We won. Now we just dictate. No compromises. <laughs> you get something like that. That's not democracy. <laughs> democracy is, is, is based on people from different walks of life getting together and trying to hammer out common solutions. Negotiation is critical to it, compromise, trying to come to grips with differences and not just steamroll the opposition. Uh, but that requires actual exchange. It requires interaction. It requires people getting together from different walks of life and talking and learning about each other and pooling knowledge. So I see a lot of this as a kind of epistemic problem, right? We have to share knowledge and perspectives and build new perspectives out of that pool of knowledge. Yeah, I liked um, uh, that nugget that you uh, had about how uh, interracial juries produce uh, are better instances of, I don't know, public reason than um, non-integrated juries. What, what's the research behind yeah. that? Well, yeah, so there's this one guy, Samuel Summers, uh, who's done some wonderful work on uh, mock juries. So he goes down to the courtroom where real juries are being impaneled. So these are people who've actually been selected into the jury pool. And then he offers, okay, if they haven't been selected for a real trial, 
he goes up, he says, well, do you want to be in a mock trial? And he gets people who are already kind of in a jury <laughs> mind. Uh, is he going to so get six he, bucks he a day or whatever it is? <laughs> I think he pays That's them good. more. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, he exposes them to, uh, you know, the facts of a, you know, fictional trial. And then he mics the, the jury room. Now, in the old days, you know, they actually mic'd real jury deliberations, but then that was Nick's. You're not, you're not allowed to spy <laughs> on real jury deliberations. But it turns out that even in a mock jury, people really take on the the kind of conscientiousness of jury service. They take it seriously. What he found was you get together mock juries, you could have an all white jury, you could have a mixed race jury. What he found is that the mixed race jury is more epistemically responsible on every measure you could think of. They deliberate longer, they consider more facts, they consider what is known as missing evidence, that is, what evidence did the prosecution fail to present that really should have been presented in order to nail the case that this person's guilty. They're more likely to notice racial bias in the trial proceedings, you know, if there was any bigotry that was appealed to by uh, one or the other side. Well, you kind or, of see this in, yeah. in um, like, like in cases like the OJ trial, where you know the the enormous the white white audience is like gobsmacked by the results, but there are actually white jurors, and the white jurors were because they were in a, an integrated jury. You know, they they say, well, actually, you know, it was pretty reasonable if you'd been there, and you know, whereas <laughs> uh, you can imagine that if it was an all white jury, it would be more like the general white reaction. Well, yeah, I think that's right. Now, personally, I find it hard to believe he oh, wasn't yeah. guilty. <laughs> But uh, but but I think part of the issue was distrust of the police, given the long history of racism right. by the police. And, and, and the grounds it's for, not the, a for, for distrusting the police were pretty well made, given Mark. Actually, yeah, they were talking about that on the radio, and I heard the name Mark Furman for the first time. And whatever happened to that guy? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. but a, another yeah. piece uh, from uh, uh, that I just saw was how. Judges that have daughters, male judges that have daughters, are, are they are demonstrably more likely to rule, you know, in a more women, women favorable way than than you know judges that don't. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, I they know, did a, a recent that. study on that. So, uh, and and that would be uh, no. I, I think what it was was it was politically oriented that uh, even conservative Republican appointees. Who have uh, daughters tend to their their decisions are more towards the middle than if they didn't have daughters. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you're you're um, a philosopher engaging with the social sciences with with the. Now you started as an economics major, uh, and you've sort of answered this already. But was it that philosophy of science class that drew you to philosophy? Or were you already uh, tending there? Yeah, so <clears throat> I originally started off as an econ major, uh, and you know, but I was taking philosophy, and there was actually one kind of moment of truth. <laughs> so I'm studying the foundations of economic theory, and I came across this wonderful article by Amartya Sen. It was published in an economics journal. It's called Behavior and the Concept of Preference. And basically, it was a beautiful piece of analytical philosophy. He looks at the concept of preference as it's used in economic theory, and he says, look, they're conflating three entirely distinct ideas. One is what you choose. You know, you prefer A to B in the sense that you chose A over B. The other is preference in the sense, this is what I want for myself. Like, I really like this more. I like A more than B. Um, <clears throat> and the other is... You know, you want it for some other reason, but not necessarily because it's for yourself. Like, you might want it because uh, you think that you're obeying a norm of etiquette. So, you know, why might you not take the last roll in a basket at the dinner? Because you think somebody else might want it. It seems rude to take the last. Because you really want that last uh, roll. But you really might want it. That's the thing. <laughs> you might be the person who most wants the last roll. But the rule of etiquette constrains you. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really big because what it does is 
if, if you can't, if you're not allowed to conflate those concepts, then all the basic theorems of welfare economics fall to pieces. You can't infer just because somebody chose something on the market that it, that it advanced their self-interest, uh, that it was better for them. You don't know. I mean, if they feel constrained by some other duty or obligation or social norm, then you can't you can't assume that what they chose is is something that really is helpful to them or advances their welfare. Uh, and you know there are a variety of cases in which I think choice under those kinds of perceived constraints uh, uh, calls into question the uh, the nice ideas that we have about the outcomes of of market exchange. Now, it doesn't mean that markets are all bad. I think markets are indispensable in a free society, but it does raise questions about how far we should we should push the logic of untrammeled free markets. Yeah, I mean that that's become something of a, a like a, a I don't know a, a fundamental idea in American culture that uh, that what the market produces is good is what people want. I mean, it, it's like a it's taken to be not even theoretical. It's it's like it's supposedly pre-theoretical now. It's kind of like how, uh, uh, is it Moore who uh, was that uh, who's at Illinois who was a, a Plato scholar and then he taught a class on gay ethics in the summer. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, and when he first uh, took it, he it was uh, he taught it, and it was a bunch of jocks. He said who took the class because they thought it was a blow off class and they'd never come across the term heterosexual uh, because they just <laughs> said it was just regular guys, you know, and, and the same thing yeah. is, I think is true of capitalism now that it's like, no, that's, that's reality. This other stuff is theory. Um, and it's, it's kind of come to that point that you can't even say, look, this is a, just one amongst competing theories and it should be questioned just as much. Well, there are also competing practices. So <clears throat> just to give an example, right, underlying the ideology of capitalism is the idea that people aren't going to do stuff for other people if you don't give them some incentive. What's in it for me? But then you look at alternative social practices, you see people are perfectly willing. Look at the internet, all this free information. It's an unbelievable boon for not just for scholars, but anybody who's just curious Wikipedians. about stuff. Look at Wikipedia. Also, all these academics, right? We're putting all kinds of free information up there. We just want to be read. Well, but we are in a pretty <laughs> we situation, to, like, though. We're, we're in a position. It is true we want to be read, but, uh, uh, you know, we're in a position where we can. That's quite right. But there's also a lot of people who just put up information uh, without any expectation for yeah, I, compensation. I just, so they want yeah, to communicate ever, with people. Um, if you ever want to like change the batteries in something that's tricky, it's on YouTube. Somebody, you type in the model of what it is, and there's a little yeah. video where some somebody, usually with a Sheffield accent for some reason, you know, shows you how to change the batteries. <laughs> and it's great, and it's like some teenager. And, uh, right. It is. I, I, my kid pointed that out, you know, when I was trying to change, like, um, update the memory in a laptop. He just said, "Well, go to YouTube," and okay, and then, there it is. Yeah, exactly. And here's another remarkable thing is that uh, so my husband, he loves uh, he, he has a long commute into Dearborn and back and he he likes to listen to history tapes. So there's this guy online called uh, Dan Carlin who does history lectures. He's a total amateur. But he's very entertaining and very erudite. He's really, you know, An he's read a ton of things. Yeah. And he, he just gives these wonderful lectures so uh, it's for free. It's on there, on the web. And my husband downloads them. And then he thought, you know, I've been getting so much learning from this guy. I really feel like compensating him. And there's a little link you could press and you could pay this guy for stuff that he's providing for free. And my husband decided, okay, you know, we should really give him a hunk of change for this. <laughs> and he did. We got like this lovely message back from Carlin 
saying that, in fact, he's so pleased by the generosity of people who, you know, didn't have to pay, uh, that this has enabled him, basically, this is how he makes his living. <laughs> Imagine that. So here, you know, economic theory would say it's crazy. You're getting something for free. Why, you know, why pay for it? But in fact, there's enough people out there who who pay for it that he can make his living. Well, but I think what most people would say is, well, that's the free market. You want it, you, buy, you pay for it. So I don't think... I think he gets subsumed into the general, you know, that's not a counterexample. That's just the market in all its wonder. Well, but it's not the market in the sense that there's no contractual relation. It's it's pure gift giving on both sides. It's it's pure reciprocal gift giving. And as we know, the anthropologists will tell us is that gift giving, that's a distinct logic from the market. Yeah, and, and sometimes fraught, a, a fraught practice. It is definitely right. I'm not at all advocating that we return to a society where people get what they need through gift giving, because we do know you look at the pot right. potlatch system and other systems. There's always something in the background what, in return for getting what you need. You got to subordinate yourself to the person who gave it. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a relationship with an aunt. That... <laughs> now, um, talking about uh, you, you seem to be sort of forging a path a little bit away from, uh, I don't know, the way analytic philosophy has been practiced. Uh, would you say that's true or would you say that you're part of a new trend in, in I mean, uh, I, I think PAPA, for example, Philosophy and Public Affairs, was, that was the idea, something like what you're doing was the idea behind it. But you do see an awful lot of, like, standard philosoph philosophical kind of nitpicking going on that is not really going to be of much interest to non-philosophers. Do you... Yeah. Um, so part of what is uh, inspiring me is pragmatism. Dewey. Uh, Dewey, exactly. And Dewey, you know, even though he overlapped with the analytics, the truth is he was educated and intellectually formed decades before analytic philosophy uh, came to the United States. Uh, and, you know, the downside of that is you actually read Dewey and it's an incredible slog. <laughs> He's not reading as clearly as, you know, uh, uh, we would like. But at the same time, I think his instincts are, are, are fundamentally right. You get your problems from the world, and, and you work through them. Uh, and that, that's what I want to bring back. And I also want to bring back the idea that um, <clears throat> it doesn't take a lot of um, technical apparatus to get at what's really important and to express it. These ideas should be communicable to people who don't have sophisticated training in the tools of analytic philosophy. Most of the core ideas you can get out very simply. And that way, it's that's one of the reasons why I like Piketty, <laughs> right? You don't need a whole lot of technical Well, and, and you, I, your writing uh, style in general is, is very accessible. And I, it's always a relief <laughs> to come across philosophers who write like you write. I mean, uh, uh, who's uh, another guy? Uh, the, who's the New Zealand guy who writes on property? Forgotten his name, but anyway, uh, begins with W. He's uh, he's another one, but they're, they're, it's kind of rare to come across writers in philosophy who might make a genuine effort to be accessible. Um, do you think that that's uh, is that a goal for you in particular? It's definitely a goal. Yeah, I, I want to be accessible and also show that philosophy is can be really fun. <laughs> Uh, it's also one of the reasons why in my current work on the history of egalitarianism, I'm reading all these non-canonical authors. A lot of them are really loopy and wild, but boy, are yeah, they fun. Yeah, I noticed fun. you giving a talk on Thomas <laughs> Paine, for example. Exactly, now, uh, You've yeah. also changed, just recently, you've changed your title from the John Rawls Collegiate Professor of Philosophy and Women's Studies to the John Dewey. Is that like a mark of your uh, change in... <laughs> <laughs> Well, basically, I got I got promoted from collegiate professor to university professor, and every time that happens, you get to change your title. So, in fact, I had always wanted to be the John Dewey professor, but uh, at the time, I was I was 
uh, asked to be collegiate professor, my colleague Steve Darwall had already nabbed the Dewey line. But now that he's at Yale, I could get it. <laughs> no, I, I, great, I have, you know, tremendous debt, of course, to my advisor, John Rawls. But, uh, but I wanted to dig deeper into the history. And yeah, talking of Rawls, I mean, in the 20th century, Rawls was sort of the preeminent political <laughs> philosopher, you know, towers over everybody in Anglo-American philosophy. Um, but at the same time, when you read Rawls, and it can be painful, um, it's uh, it's very dense. There are very few examples, and but it is a systematic. He's a systematic thinker, so it's uh, and it is well, it is ideal theory, and you do non-ideal theory, as you say. I mean, do you think? Um, do you think that Rawls's influence has been a good thing or has been a bad thing? Because for the for the longest time, political philosophy was basically responses to Rawls. Yeah. Um, do you think that's changing, and do you think that's good? Or I mean, obviously, as you said, you were you, your inner Rawlsian came out in response to like egalitarianism, but in general. Yeah. So I learned tremendous amounts. Everybody from him says he's and, just the nicest guy uh, in the world. Very, yeah, amazing. Yeah, really amazing human being. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. But I do, I do, I'm much more moved by contemporary trends in non-ideal theory. I think a lot of uh, uh, philosophies, political philosophy is moving in that direction, especially when we look at international justice. Because people are, see there are all these intractable problems in the wider world. Uh, uh, and even to come to grips with it, we're so used, we're sort of take for granted the familiar domestic American scene or, you know, European scene, developed world scene. Uh, the world, the problems in uh, the least developed countries are dramatically different. And so it, it take, it, I think it almost forces us to come to grips with very different social context uh, uh, and different sorts of problems. Uh, and, and that's the impulse towards non-ideal theories. You start with what the problems are that people are suffering from and, and look at them in some detail about what's causing them, uh, what are the underlying mechanisms and so forth, and, and start building but theory do you out think from that. you have a grand view underneath? I mean, because you've written on affirmative action, <clears throat> surrogate motherhood, uh, dependent care, and you've you've had stuff on animal rights, atheistic morality, uh, Kant, emotions <laughs> in Kant's right. moral philosophy. Well, putting those to the side, but I mean things like uh, affirmative action and surrogate motherhood. Do you think you have an overall theory that maybe you don't quite know what it is, but it's emerging, or do you think that these could, you genuinely should deal with these problems in isolation? Well, so I have some background um, values or ideas. The basic structure that are driving of, you. A lot of this. <laughs> well, you know, I, I am very moved by this background ideal of, you know, a society of free and equal people. And what 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 would and it take to achieve? And you say you do non-ideal theory, but that. Well, but it's an ideal in the way Dewey thought of ideals, which is they're more like instruments or tools of exploration. And so you can't vindicate an ideal just through sheer argumentation. Ultimately, you know, you have a picture of the kind of society you want or social relations or solutions to a particular problem, but then you have to test it in an experiment in living. Mill was the same way. And so... Just because you, you have this picture you think is justified by argument, it's, it's not sufficient. You put it into practice and see whether you can actually so that's part live of the with reason, the results. Presumably, that you're interested in all this history of egalitarian movements. But isn't it a bit depressing Absolutely. given how so many of them failed? Well, and that's actually part of the richness of the story, right? And in fact, it's very important to look very closely at the failures. Uh, you know, people have had all kinds of ideas for how to create a, a society of equals. Like maybe we should all live in a commune. This has been tried time and again, time and again it fails, right? Well, that's really interesting. It, it turns out that there's only a very small number of people in, in developed societies 
who can tolerate living in a communal society. I mean, there are some people for whom it really suits them. The vast majority of people are much more individualistic. Once they have the freedom and the material means to, to live in a smaller unit, uh, they prefer that. That, I think, is an incredibly powerful impulse in human beings, and egalitarians really have to pay very deep attention to it. So the history of failure of communal experiments, I think, is a tremendous source of learning. And, and what you see is that egalitarians really did learn from this. You had, in the early 19th century, a huge number of experiments. You know, the United States was the hotbed of experimentation in utopian socialism. Amazing, isn't it? You had the Oneida community... Owens coming out. It's like the United States was this super radical place where there's all this open territory and people could create these amazingly radical experiments, but they all fail. <laughs> okay, so egalitarians really did have to go back to the drawing board and they had to think of a way in which you could realize a society of equals where you don't have too much intimacy. <laughs> and in a way, um, democracy, right, is part of that. You scale up the the size of the unit, but with more distance between people, right? So all, we're only partially accountable to each other in a democratic form uh -huh. if we're thinking at the state level, uh, uh, right? A lot of, we still reserve a lot of independence and freedoms for ourselves. We only regulate those matters that are, you know, critically I think, shared. Uh, the only people who should be allowed to write on this are people who've had kids who demand their own rooms and... <laughs> you know, insist <laughs> on what is theirs, despite the fact that you've paid for it all. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because Bob Ellickson, who's a very interesting property theorist, more on the libertarian side, he has some really wonderful work on the origins of property and, and how, for instance, the Mormons started off in communal existence out in Utah, but then pretty soon they decide they're gonna divide up the plots into the individual farms. Very compelling reasoning for this, but one of the things he said about the collapse of the hippie communes, how come the hippies couldn't get it together with all their idealism about communal living? He says because they couldn't, they couldn't figure out who had to do the dishes. <laughs> the dishes are just piling Which is up why uh, you doing. said uh, <laughs> the bureaucracy is actually enormously important, which is a sad thing to discover, but an important thing. <laughs> Well, right. I mean, bureaucracy exists. It does actually serve some functions. And one of it is you can assign people to roles and then, you know, they got to perform it. Uh, but it's, they're also replaceable. You know, a downside of communal existence is that usually what keeps it together is some kind of charismatic leader. The leader dies and the whole thing falls to pieces. Uh, bureaucracies, they don't need charisma. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, <laughs> actually is an advantage because if you right. look at what charismatic leadership gets you, you know, sometimes it's actually, really um, bad. <laughs> there was something, uh, an another thing, NPR is, is how I get all my examples, but another thing I heard recently was about a history of kitchens and kitchens mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. It was very important that Stalin had these, uh, instituted this policy of communal kitchens and it was very oppressive because uh, this would be a way that the secret police would spy on everybody. And, and it was only, yeah, right, uh, right. you know, in, Bre in the Brezhnev years when uh, kitchens became more pr private that, that actually they became, people sort of carried over this idea that they should meet there, but then they became sort of hotbeds of, uh, of uh, you know, subversion when it was less obviously a, a tool of oppression. So, but, but this, this thing of how mm -hmm. communal kitchens, sort of their role developed and how important they were to Soviet society, I think is another instance. Yes, I agree. Yeah. That impulse to privacy is really, really a, 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 a very important thing. It used to be. I mean, like when apparently we all just slept in one big room and, you know, People had sex in public except for the royals. I mean, isn't that supposed to be the way it was? <laughs> well, even the royals, you know, if you, if you visit the palace at Versailles, you find out that they hadn't invented the hallway yet. And so you just have, you go from what, you know, from salon through a bedroom to another salon through a bedroom and so forth. <laughs> you know, I don't People think they had much of an idea of privacy back then. So, 
<laughs> yes, so how do you explain it? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. uh, all of the, the, the great political theorists uh, take a stance on how malleable human nature is, you know, how, uh, whether or not um, uh, human nature can be shaped by institutions or whether or not hu human nature shapes institutions or to what degree. And then uh, if they've been shaped by this set of institutions, they're kind of baked for a while and you can't rush in and try and uh, install these new institutions because it won't work. Uh, what's your, st I mean, do you think that there is a basic uh, human nature that all uh, all institutions have to take a, take a notice of, or do you think that it is more malleable? Yeah, so I, I think that human nature is basically the same everywhere, but that institutions uh, draw on the human nature in the sense of our emotional capacities and repertoires. Uh, right, our fundamental responses to the world. I think it's the same everywhere. But what institutions do is they'll channel those impulses in, in different ways. They'll make more use of some than others. Uh, uh, they can mobilize cooperation on a larger and larger scale. I think that's a major feature of modernity, right, is how, how do you get cooperation outside, you know, beyond the scale of the local tribe to larger and larger units. I think that's actually a, a, a major key to both the advancement of peace in the world and cooperation and economic development. It's just scaling up. You don't up. want people to sulk um, on their own rocks. <laughs> well, yeah, right? Expanding the, 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 the extent of cooperation is just really critical to expanding prosperity uh, and trust too. So, you know, if you look at, at the most fundamental level, how do you expand trust? I think those institutional forms are, you know, of course there's gonna be cultural variation in different societies depending on backgrounds, ideologies and norms and traditions and so forth. So there's a lot of variations on a theme, uh, uh, but, the, but, but the general idea that you can do stuff to expand trust between strangers. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what a lot of uh, institutional development is about. So we're capable of cooperating with strangers, but you need the right institutional context to make that happen. I think reality uh, to make TV that is so perhaps the most important thing. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm only half joking. I think that, uh, for example, uh, now that we've had, you know, the gay marriage movement, the next hurdle is, is transgender people. But... I think, I agree. you know, yeah. I, in the time over the past, you know, 10 years, I think people just weren't aware of transgender people like 10 years ago, the vast majority. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're in, in some urban centers, you'd be aware, but, you know, the vast majority of people. But now I think because of this profusion of reality TV shows and things like that, uh, people are much more aware. And I think that helps towards that. That helps towards acceptance is is knowing. I agree completely. And, and you know, showing transgender people getting on with their lives and, you know, being basically normal and having the same kind, you know, loving people and working hard and, you know, having just ordinary concerns like anybody else, I think it's critical to humanizing them and, and to so, accept I, I mean, it's It's interesting that uh, in, in the United States at, at the moment you have these sort of in, in one sense, uh, those on the left see there's sort of retrenchment and, you know, gun gun rights seem to be, uh, well, the fact that I said gun <laughs> rights <laughs> means that, uh, you know, I'm using uh, terminology that's uh, favorable to the legalization side, uh, that, that seems to be expanding and abortion rights are being cut back everywhere. But at the same time, we're, we're also getting this huge, uh, as I would characterize it, steps forward in gay rights and, and things. And I, I see the gay rights as being sort of a cultural issue, that it's coming from being exposed on the TV, being exposed on the Internet, whereas the gun rights and stuff seems to be coming motivated uh, politically. So it's sort of you've got the forces of culture uh, are... The you know the, the the liberals like what they're doing, and, and then but you have this sort of drive 
uh, against sort of th this drive to muddy the water on global warming. You know, now a greater percentage of people are doubtful about global warming than 10 years ago, despite the fact that the science, the science hasn't changed. If anything, it's got more and more alarming. Um, so there's sort of different channels of information. And of course, you know, the, the woolly liberal says, well, once you show people what people are like, they will come to accept them. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so yeah, one of the worries here is that uh, as a cognitive psychologist, never tire of reminding us, uh, human beings are not all that rational. <laughs> Uh, so much of the worst for philosophers. Arguments aren't really uh, no. uh, what cut it. Um, that, that's, it's a real problem. Uh, but at the same time, I do think that there's a certain degree of interesting movement. So a lot of it depends on framing. Um, if people see action on global warming as kind of, you know, coming from the Democratic Party or from liberals, that labeling makes an awful lot of people very suspicious. On the other hand, you talk to a Republican farmer in Oklahoma who's facing long-term drought, okay? He's got a real problem, and he knows he's got to deal with it. It's a matter of how you reach people and at what level you communicate with them. Uh, and, and there are channels that can be used. So a lot of it has to do with the circles of trust. What sources of information do you trust? What do you not trust? And sure, you know, your typical... Tea Party person uh, is not going to trust the liberal talking head on TV. But the fact You're that not they trust them as a liberal board, talking head, but they that's will something trust. that is an achievement <clears throat> of certain forces on the right, that they have they have succeeded in, in yeah. presenting this view of the, I mean, maybe there's some truth to it. It's, I mean, it, you know, you can show studies that the majority of reporters are left-leaning or whatever, um, but... Although, you know, the majority <laughs> of true. newspaper the majority owners, of are, newspaper very owners are Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but that's an achievement in, in sort of uh, changing the mindset it is they've managed to get this idea out of, of it's all relative. That now there is no relative. It's, it's funny that you hear, uh, you know, Republican talking heads talking about moral relativism of the left. But the real relativism is coming from the right. It's saying that that's it's all just opinion. So stick with our opinion because you know you you trust us. We're like you. <laughs> well, I think there's a certain amount of truth to that. Uh, but there's also ways to change minds. So, for instance, there are some Christian evangelicals who are on board with uh, climate change. So my recommendation is, you know, for environmentalists, <laughs> don't send Al Gore out to the heartland of America. Although Identify is from the evangelicals who are on board. Uh, well, Tennessee, I don't know. I think of the heartland as like Kansas. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you got to pick the right people to communicate. You know, people who already have some bond of trust. Uh, but that, that's possible. And there has to be, you know, the left has to talk more to the right. It's not just a problem with the right only talking to itself. Uh, uh, the, the left has, has its own problems and its own echo chambers. I don't think that those are as severe as they are on the right. Uh, but, you know, there's got to be a lot more communication across these, these ideological now, boundaries. Gia, talking of which, um, now that you're writing stuff that is uh, sort of has impact outside of academic philosophy, are you finding the critical response different? I mean, are you getting sort of blowback from both sides or uh, is it, I mean, are, are you getting the same kind of thing or are you finding that there's a wider range of, of criticism of when you put stuff out? So, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting. When you put stuff out to the wider public, you get a, a much wider range of responses. So, by far the most influential piece I've ever written from the standpoint of, you know, non-academics is this little piece I wrote oh, yeah. uh, on well, atheism. Well, that's because it was in Hitchens. I've got uh, a tremendous Hitchens. response, man. Yeah. It was in Hitchens volume, which, by the way, oh, yeah? he lifted without telling me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mind. It, apparently, I had signed away the copyright to Oxford, and so Oxford just sent it out. But yeah. you think as a courtesy they should tell the author. 
<laughs> I found out about it because I was looking on the bookshelf and at the bookstore one day came across Hitchens volume and I'm surprised to see my own essay in there <laughs> but it's, it's got a tremendous response because a lot of people who read it are people who were raised uh, you know in a Christian household I mean seriously Christian household uh, and you know they had doubts and exploration they start reading Hitchens right <laughs> I've got a lot of emails with people like that very appreciative emails um, but on the other hand, you know, sometimes you get tougher stuff. So I, I appeared on a panel at the University of Michigan campus that was dealing with police racial profiling of students on campus. And the panel included some African-American students who felt very intimidated when the police have a, a bulletin that says, you know, black male wearing blue jeans and a backpack looks between the ages of 18 and 24 and he's between, you know, five seven and six right. two, and it, like describes ninety well, percent of the basketball black team. campus, right? And, well, no, not quite, but that's a very small number of people, you know. Um, and so uh, they said about how they would actually like skip class that day because they didn't want to be harassed by the police. And then they t told vivid stories about how they'd been harassed. There was on this panel. And I talked about uh, how just completely generic descriptions like that are, number one, not useful as warnings. What are they doing? They're teaching you know, all, everybody to avoid all the black men under any description, practically. It's not useful. Uh, it's very damaging to them. And that, you know, I, I didn't say you shouldn't have any racial descriptions at all, but you got to have something very narrow and specific so you can, you know, actually identify somebody in particular. You know, like scar on the left cheek or well, something like this. You know, that's identifiable. It says. <clears throat> Whatever. Yeah. Any rate, uh, in response to that, I uh, uh, received death threats from a wow racist organization. <laughs> so <laughs> you get all kinds of responses when you when you speak to the wider public. Okay. Well, I've I've kept you busy for about an hour. I mean, I could. Ask, uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. This was uh, this was great, and uh, thanks for making the time. Yeah, it was fun.